Okay. Yeah. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, algebraic algorithms for null cone membership problem for the left right action. So I will try and sort of recall what we've already seen about this and uh, then put it in perspective. And uh, yeah, so this uh, is joint work with uh, Yoming and Gabor. And uh, yeah, so the uh, problem starts off with uh, really trying to understand Edmund's problem. Uh, so Edmund's problem is computing the symbolic rank of a matrix of this form. So you have a matrix uh, where there are, so you have a bunch of variables, x1 up to xn, and each entry here is a linear form, say uh, a1, x1 plus n x n, you're given some m cross n matrices, an m cross n matrix, and you want to understand uh, whether you want to know what the symbolic rank, what is the rank of this matrix. So you can assume that these AIs are in uh, integers. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. And you want to really uh, calculate the rank. And uh, one knows that uh, the decision version of this, checking if this is full rank, is really your determinant, symbolic determinant identity testing. And uh, we don't really uh, have any idea of how to do this. Yeah, uh, of course. And there are various versions of this depending upon uh, what field your AIs come from. Uh, so it, it turns out that uh, for different fields, there, uh, so there are fields for which one knows that it is actually NP hard. So if I assume, for example, that my field is uh, a little low of, okay, here's a little omina of M, then it is NP hard. Uh, but we will always assume that our field size is large enough. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be the, uh, the general setting and one would really like to understand the rank of uh, this. And this is in some sense the holy grail of uh, some part of complexity theory, certainly. Yeah. Uh, so what the focus of uh, this talk is going to be, try to look at this whole thing uh, in a non-commutative setting. So when I say non-commutative, what I mean is these variables that we have chosen, we'll assume that these variables are non-commuting variables. And uh, it is that setting that we are actually going to look at. So we will assume that these elements really come from a free skew field. So I'm not going to define what a free skew field is. But let us just assume that there is an underlying field F, uh, which we have uh, taken and we have a bunch of variables which don't compute. And uh, uh, one can then talk of uh, the non-commutative rank of this. And it has all the nice properties uh, that one uh, has of rank. In fact, you will see uh, in uh, Hirai's talk later, he will also talk about various things, including the rank. He will also talk about the determinant and so on in, the, in this setting. Yeah, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so here also, I mean, if I give you a matrix and I ask you the column rank or I ask you the row rank, it turns out that uh, for non commutative rank also, the notion is the same. The row rank is actually equal to column rank. Uh, but there is another description of uh, this, uh, which is uh, sort of nice, uh, which again uh, is also a description we know exists in commutative in the commutative world. Uh, so you look at the S for which I can write M as M by S times M, S by M matrix. So can I express it as a product of an M cross S and an S cross M matrix? And this in some sense gives you the rank also. Yeah, and uh, okay, so we will soon see that the non-commutative rank actually dominates the rank of a matrix. Yeah. So, uh, so this is something that we are uh, we will soon see very soon. So, one more way of understanding this non-commutative rank is to think of these xi's as matrices. Yeah, little matrices, and that is really the approach that we will actually take. It is much like what uh, uh, Ram Prasad was speaking about also, when dealing with non-commutative, uh, in the non-commutative world, the right 
uh, way to imagine variables is to replace them by matrices and work over matrices. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there are uh, various formulations of this, and uh, this problem of computing the non-commutative rank goes back actually uh, uh, to Cohn, and uh, but it was sort of revived in this work by Fortin and uh, Rottenyard. Uh, so they, uh, uh, so I, I don't remember now, but uh, they actually showed that this was decidable. Yeah, but uh, Gurwit sort of in a remarkable piece of work in uh, the early 2000s, uh, considered uh, a promise problem of symbolic determinant identity testing, where uh, he actually says, well, if I either I will promise you uh, so, uh, okay, so the way uh, I, I will formulate, uh, I'll write down Guru's formulation very soon. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, this was once again uh, formulated in uh, well, uh, work by uh, Lubris and uh, Wigderson uh, when they were looking at uh, non commutative circuits and they were looking at depth in non commutative circuits. And that is how they ran into this problem of actually trying to understand the non commutative rank of uh, given a symbolic matrix, try and understand its non its rank over uh, interpreting these exercises as uh, uh, non, -commut non commuting variables. Yeah. So uh, for us, uh, so this notation, M sorry, what did I do? MNF uh, will be. Uh, uh, n cross n matrices over the field F. And uh, an important notion for us is going to be a matrix space. So a matrix space is a linear subspace of M and F. So you are given, uh, <clears throat> so you are told that uh, this subspace that you are looking at is closed under addition. And a scalar multiplication from outside. You take two vectors, you can add them, two matrices, you can add them, you come back here. And it is closed under multiplication by the field element. And it has the zero matrix. Okay, so uh, to come back to Gurwit's formulation, it will be useful to think of this matrix that is given to us as, uh, oh, so I interchanged M and N, yeah, but I'll stick with this because this is what. Uh, is there in the rest of the talk. So I have m variables, x1, x2, xn, and uh, I will think of my matrix, initial matrix as, so from this initial matrix that is given to us, this matrix T that is given to us, let me make this also m, I can uh, look at, uh, I can pull out x1 and look at all terms which have x1 and pull out their, the constants into b1. Then I can pull out all terms uh, which have x2, pull out their constants, get the matrix to be true. So I can, of course, write my matrix T as a linear combination of xi, bi's, where bi's are n cross n matrices. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, okay. So then these bi's give me a natural uh, vector, uh, natural matrix space. So what I will do is I will look at the subspace spanned by these M matrices. Yeah. So this is the linear subspace of interest. Yeah, and uh, uh, one can actually show that, uh, so then, then I have various notions now. Uh, what is the rank of uh, this linear subspace? The, na the natural definition is, uh, the so inside this subspace, you're looking at all matrices that you can actually get. And uh, you are looking at the matrix with the largest rank. That is what I call the rank of a script or Cal B. Yeah. And uh, if mod F, uh, if the cardinality of your field is larger than the size, then in fact, one can actually show that the rank that you get here is in fact the rank of the underlying. Uh, uh, it really only depends upon the linear subspace does not depend upon anything else. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so the, the, the rank of uh, this transformation T is the same as the rank of the 
uh, linear uh, the, the may the matrix with the largest rank in that linear subspace. So it's really a property of that linear subspace. And uh, the first thing we will actually see that even non-commutative rank is really a property of this B itself, the script B itself. Yeah. So even though these XIs could be non-commuting, when I'm looking at script B and I'm looking at the linear space spanned by script B, the non-commutative rank also corresponds to some property of uh, this. Yeah. So actually uh, studying matrix spaces can be a little subtle. Uh, so one has to be careful about how the matrix space is presented to you and so on. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, we will not have such problems here. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. So the uh, first thing is uh, the notion of a C shrunk subspace. Yeah. So what is a C shrunk subspace? Uh, so we have our matrices B1 up to Bm. Uh, we say U subset of Fn is C shrunk. C is a constant, uh, a num an integer, in fact, a non a natural number. If there exists uh, W, uh, you, you, if there exists W also, so these are all um, rectangular uh, square matrices, so we'll have no such problem. We have, so that's why I can do this, such that dimension of W is less than or equal to dimension of U minus C. And for every B in Cal B, it is the case that if I apply B to this subspace, I end up inside the image ends up inside W. So this subspace U is sort of shrunk by every matrix in B into W. Yeah, is this definition clear? Yeah, I presume so. Okay, so the question is, uh, what is the largest C for which I can find a C shrunk subspace. For which there is uh, a C shrunk So U is uh, given and one wants to understand this. So this is uh, the formulation of interest to us. Yeah, you're given, um, and I'll show you all, uh, it will turn out that non-commutative rank is related to this question actually. Okay, so when, uh, when we look at, uh, when I fix my field to be complex numbers, I can think of uh, B1, B2, Bm as giving me a natural operator on positive definite matrices. Let C be the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. Yeah. So given B1, B2, Bn, I can talk of a map P, which takes C. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me write it like this. Maybe, yeah, so map from C to matrices. Let, let me see. C to, actually it uh, goes back. Uh, so what, what does this do? P of C, I'll write it as summation BI, C, BI dagger. Yeah. And now if I look at, uh, <clears throat> so this uh, operator, so I'm thinking of P as an operator on the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. Uh, and the question, uh, so one, the question one asks is, is this a rank decreasing positive, completely positive operator? That is, is there a positive semi-definite matrix uh, so that the when I start with that positive semi-definite matrix, I apply the operator P to it. I get another matrix of the same form. And I ask, what is the rank of P of C? 
and one wants to know if the rank of p of c is has shrunk yeah and the same question can be asked there what is the largest c for which well, okay this c and this c are this is okay maybe i should put a script c yeah and then i'm picking out a, a c inside this and i'm asking for whether it is shrunk or it is not shrunk and then i can ask for the difference between the rank of what i start with and the rank of what i end up with yeah, I see. yeah. and the same question appears uh, yeah, in operator theory yeah so uh, one yet another motivation uh, which uh, is uh, which comes from geometric invariant theory is null cone membership problem so you are you are given this bunch of matrices so b1 b2 vm then there is a natural action of sln cross sln what is the action if i give you a pair x comma y in sln cross sln there is a left action it takes this tuple and sends it to this tuple which is x b1 y transpose x b2 y transpose x b m y transpose yeah. one can check that this is an action of sln cross sln on m tuples so this is the action on mat n direct sum m yeah, this is an action on this and uh, uh, this uh, uh, question of whether uh, this collection of matrices actually shrinks the subspace is intimately related to understanding the null cone of this problem yeah, so i will indicate how so null cone recall is uh, uh, so given an action of a group on a vector space v uh well, in our case this group also happens to be reductive so it is really nice i then i know that the ring of invariants is finitely generated so take the ring of invariants and look at the zero locus of the ring of invariants that is what the null cone is and one wants to know uh, given b1 b2 bm is b1 b2 bm in the null cone or not yeah and uh, <clears throat> so the fourth motivation comes from an old question actually which was posed in uh, cone's book is to look at okay this should be also script b yeah so given a matrix space b yeah a linear subspace of n cross n matrices in our case the dth blow up of this is defined to be the set of all matrices i can get by tensoring so look at uh the span of b1 tensor mnf mdf sorry mdf b2 tensor mdf so you look at you tensor it with an arbitrary d cross d matrices in your field now from n by n matrices what you end up with is nd by nd matrices and then i get nd by nd matrices and i can ask what is the rank of what is the largest rank that i get in this new collection of matrices this is clearly a linear uh, subspace of nd by nd matrices so in that linear subspace i can ask what is the largest rank matrix that i see and if i scale it down by d it will turn out that these numbers are uh, monotonically increasing as a function of d and they converge so one may want to understand what is the limit of these collection of numbers so it is known that rank of this is bigger than rank of b d minus 1 by d minus 1 and so in fact we we'll use this also okay so there are uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, sort of various um, reasons one has come to this problem okay so uh so when uh, in uh, 2016 uh, we gave uh, so given b1 b2 bm uh, uh, we showed that there is an exponential time algorithm which decides whether b1 b2 bm is in the null core or not yeah uh, 
so in fact i'm going to give much of that proof today excepting uh, details of uh, working with certain kinds of division algebras so that i will not give yeah so exponential time uh, then uh, um, uh, guru uh, gurvets uh, garg oliviera and uh, vigderson uh, they actually looked at uh, gurvets work Uh, which was a promise problem. So, you know, or maybe I didn't mention it at all. In Gurvit's work, he promises that this B either shrinks a subspace or it contains a full rank matrix. So he called uh, subs uh, he called matrix subspaces of this kind, which either which are under the promise that they either shrink a subspace or they contain a full rank matrix. He called them Erdos Erdos Rado. pencils yeah and under that promise he gave an algorithm actually and uh, what uh, these people did ggow did was to actually show that gurvits algorithm actually is poly time yeah it is poly yeah so that is one of their you know, main results here yeah then uh, dirksen and markham showed so this was over c yeah then dirksen and markham actually uh, showed that uh, there is a polytime algorithm for the null cone membership problem yeah uh, uh, one of the ingredients that they required in the proof was something called the regularity lemma which is in this paper and they analyzed uh, the kind of blow ups that i require very carefully they showed that the blow up satisfy certain kind of concavity property using that they were able to show that you don't have to blow up too much and they were able to get a polytime algorithm for this as a consequence they were also able to get bounds on degrees degree of the ring the max degree of the ring of in so if i look at the ring of invariants we know it is finitely generated so i might ask you well up to what degree do i need to go to pick up invariants so that they generate uh, they get bounds on the degree of the ring of invariants and they showed that the bound was around or n to the 6 o of n to the 6 something like this yeah so then as soon as we saw this paper we realized that we had missed a little trick and So we could immediately show that this, in fact, is polytime, and our algorithm again works over uh, all kinds of fields. But uh, subsequently, G G O W uh, 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 one minute. So maybe this is not G G O W. One minute. Uh, they 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 were uh, yeah. Actually, this is not G G O W, but uh, it is there later. So uh, they were able to show. that you can even check for if there are more people involved in this so i should not say this check if uh, for orbit closure actually given two m tuples of matrices is one in the orbit closure of the other yeah and then dirksen and markham gave a different proof of this and once again they use uh, 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 yeah they use uh, their formulation and uh, some very nice observations about what happens to matrices under simultaneous conjugation action yeah anyway so this is so as i said the motivation one of our motivations was really coming from git because if i look at m tuples of matrices then there is a notion of uh, when g acts on this space we know that there is there are invariants and uh, what is an invariant a function f on matrices so f is a function from mat m to say c or f whatever your underlying field was actually in, in here we will we will assume it to c okay we will assume it to c we say f is invariant if f of G dot uh, say a tuple B bar is uh, so F is invariant if uh, uh, yeah, yeah, if uh, uh, F of 
so we we want the function to be invariant on the entire we, we want a function and we want the function to be invariant on the entire orbit yeah so if this is uh, so and one is really interested in understanding the generation of this uh, ring of invariant so we know that there is a finite collection of polynomials so that the ring is finitely generated and so on and one would like to understand this so let me briefly tell you what kind of invariants there are so uh, so i assume that i have m matrices so uh, invariants are going to be polynomial functions on those matrices yeah so what are polynomial functions on those matrices which are invariant under the action so it turns out that the following is going to be true so if i give so let me think of xi as the variables associated to the uh, ith matrix so the, there are therefore n squared variables in x and the, these are a collection of n squared variables these are another collection of n squared variables and so you have a total of m n squared variables then the following is uh, sort of easily seen if i take any d tuple of matrices uh, m tuple of d cross d matrices and i tensor the first matrix with a1 the second matrix with a2 the mth matrix with am and i take the determinant of this yeah so one can easily check that the determinant of this matrix is going to be invariant under this action yeah so the determinant remains the same yeah and uh, one can in fact actually show that uh, the ring of invariants is really generated by polynomials of this kind so this is a polynomial now in these variables yeah so I expand it out get a polynomial write down all possible polynomials you can get by taking arbitrary ais and uh, as i vary d so then uh, this also tells you that invariants only exist in multiples uh in degrees which are multiples of n so you have n n cross n matrices so if each of this is therefore when i take d equal to 1 i will get uh, a, a bunch of determinants uh, uh determinant of x1 determinant of x2 determinant of xm of course is going to be invariant but there are other things that are also invariant yeah and i can write down degree n invariants then you can show that the next set of invariants will only get in degree 2n you will get the invariant in degree 3n and so on yeah and uh, this work goes back to many 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 people actually so i've just written down a few uh duxen and weiman are the oldest and they do it in the language of qers actually then actually schofield and van de berg also it is even it sort of uh, it is even before them this is an 1980s paper then domkosh and zubkov then i had a paper with Uh, Suresh Naik and Bharat Tarsul. Yeah, so there are, I mean, uh, any number of people who have rediscovered this thing of invariants for this. And of course, the natural question which motivated us was this: understanding the degree in which the ring of invariants is generated. Okay, so like I said, uh, G G O W actually gives you a poly one by uh, okay. So they they actually they do more things actually. So given a matrix, they will actually. uh check whether it can be pushed in the null cone if it cannot be pushed in the null cone then by what ankit has shown yeah, you can actually uh, uh you, you can actually so there you can define the notion of a capacity of uh, this collection of matrices one can actually compute the capacity up to a epsilon actually yeah so uh, i will not go into that but that is the connection actually uh later uh, uh Uh, so this is Alan Zhu, uh, Ankit Garg, uh, then uh, L here is, uh, is Lee, uh, Lee, Oliveira, and Vigdasen. They actually uh, show that there is a polylog one by epsilon algorithm for actually orbit closure, and then of course by what uh, Cole Frank told us about, uh, there is a vast generalization of this in terms of geodesic convexity. but of course all this works over c so the problems are the same you have a bunch of matrices you want to check whether it can be pushed to zero or you are given a bunch of matrices another bunch of matrices you want to check whether one is in the orbit closure of the other and so on. so all these problems yeah <clears throat> so uh, so uh, as i said for gurwitz uh, gurwitz solved this problem in uh, in uh, under the promise but in the promise Uh, uh he was unable to sort of show that the algorithm that he provides is polytime and that was what was analyzed in this first paper of 
GGOW, among other things. Yeah. Okay. So there is, uh, yeah. So, uh, but Gurvitz left open the question of what happens uh, to this uh, NC rank problem when I know that my matrix, the, the subspace is actually spanned by rank one matrices. Yeah. So B is spanned by this. B may, may not be given to you as being spanned by when it, when B is presented to you, it may not be presented as a bunch of rank one matrices spanning it. But suppose you are also told that there is a rank one, uh, that this subspace that you're looking at is actually spanned by rank one matrices. He left open that question because he, uh, and that question was actually solved by IKQS. Uh, this is uh, uh, Ivanios, Karpinski, Yuming Kiao, and Miklos Shanta. And for that, they introduced something called a Wong sequence, a generalized Wong sequence. And that is going to be what we are also actually going to use. Okay, so to wrap up the definitions at least. So if I give you B1, B2, Bm, and suppose there is a way of pre and post multiplying these Bi's so that all of them have this structure. Yeah, they, they have a zero, yeah. Then of course, if I look at the uh, dimension of this block of zeros that will tell me whether there is uh, and suppose these are arbitrary then of course any matrix in the linear span of this will also have such a structure and one can then check whether uh, so it turns out that if I look at this size this suppose I call this k and I call this l and if k plus l is more than n then one can actually show that this is actually shrinking a subspace. And what subspace is, is it shrinking? It is shrinking uh, this L-dimensional subspace that you see yeah, into this subspace spanned by these elements. So assume that the rows and columns are spanned by the same vectors. So then look at the subspace spanned by the last L uh, rows, la last L columns. Yeah, the last L basis elements rather, then one can actually show that if K plus L is bigger than N, then this L dimensional subspace is actually killed, uh, is actually shrunk. Yeah, so we are assuming K plus L is more than N. Okay. Uh, and uh, the, uh, yeah, and the one can actually show, maybe I have it also here. Okay, so, the, so it turns out that this is the right, definition and this is what will happen that the non-commutative rank nc rank of a matrix a is you we, we spoke about c shrunk subspaces look at the largest c for which you find a shrunk subspace and then the nc rank is n minus that yeah so that is the non-commutative rank of this and that is what we are actually going to try and do okay so of course by its by very construction uh, then you cannot expect a matrix in that linear subspace which has rank more than this. Sorry, which has rank more than this naturally. Sorry, what did I do? Yeah, uh, you cannot uh, because there is this subspace which is getting shrunk, uh, and th this is true for every element in the family. Therefore, therefore, no element in the family can have rank, rank larger than this. Yeah, so rank is clearly less than uh, rank of rank of P is less than NC rank of P. And the existence of such a large block of zeros under suitable left-right multiplication under change of basis is called a Hall blocker. And this has sort of, again, this is a problem that people were really interested in for a variety of reasons. People working in Markov chains are interested in it to understand when Markov chains you know, sort of are reducible and so on. Okay, the quintessential example, this is something again Ankit pointed out to us, are skew symmetric matrices. So, so they take three cross three skew symmetric matrices. And uh, if I look at uh, skew symmetric matrices, one can actually show that they don't shrink a subspace. So if I take three cross three skew symmetric matrices, they're, they're the largest rank in that family I can see is two but the NC rank of this is actually three. Yeah, so NC rank is, can be strictly less. 
So rank here is two and C rank is three. And this example we will really try and understand today. Okay, so before I uh, go in, so let us understand, like I said, when the IKQS paper spoke of uh, something called Wong sequences. So let us understand what Wong sequences are. So once again, these are uh, sort of notations that we have rank of B, the rank of the, look at all matrices in B, pick up the matrix with largest rank and call that the rank of B. Co rank of B is N minus that, N minus the rank of B. Okay. <clears throat> so then we, we have, we've already defined what say the C singularity witness is. We say U is C singularity, is a U singular, C singularity witness. If if I look at U and I, uh, this subspace U and I apply the operators in B onto U and I look at the dimension of the image that I get, one can show that the dimension of the image has shrunk by at least C. Yeah, so B of U, the rank of image of the dimension of the image U is less than uh, uh, the di dimension of u minus c, yeah. And uh, 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 people also call this quantity, which is n minus, the, so the largest c uh, for which it is shrunk is called, uh, is given some term and n minus that quantity is called the discrepancy of b. n minus c where c is b largest for which there exists a Sri Shank subspace. And as I said clearly, uh, if I look at co-rank of B, that is bigger than Yeah. Okay, so this is what we will need. Okay, so now what are second Wong sequences? Yeah. So I'm not going to tell you what first Wong sequences are. You should go back to the IQKS paper to look for that. So now let me pick out an element in this linear subspace given by B1, B2, Bn. Now, if it is full rank, there is nothing to be done because you have found a matrix of full rank. Otherwise, if there is an element in its kernel, let V be an element in its kernel. Then what is the second Wong sequence? How do you construct the second Wong sequence? This is the second Wong sequence. It requires two inputs. One is the family that we have. And in general, one can take another family of matrices, but in this case, I'm only going to look at the matrix A. And what is the second Wong sequence? The second Wong, in the second Wong sequence, you start with the zero vector. Because it is the zero vector, I know, and, and there is a vector V in the kernel of A, I know that V goes to zero under A. No, sorry, this is V and under A, V is zero. Yeah. So then what, how, what, what the second Wong sequence says is, okay, now you apply the operators in B to V. Yeah. And uh, you get a bunch of vectors. You get a bunch of vectors. Now, uh, the image of this V is what we will look at. Yeah. And then what I will do is, so I'm going to look at B of V. And then I'm going to pull back, look at the pre-image. If there are elements in B of V, which are in the image of A, I will look at all those elements, all those pre-images. I will, so, uh, so and, uh, and then what I will do is I will take these bunch of vectors that I have and once again, apply B and go to this side. Yeah, I will stop when I find that there are elements which I get here for which there is no pre-image in A. So there is, so I will stop if there is a BV. Okay, so let me once again say what it is. So this is what it is. So you look at, at every stage, I'm constructing WI. I'm pulling back, looking at the pre-images, 
looking at all elements of A which map into WI, then I will apply the operator B to all those bunch of elements. I will get another subspace. I will take that subspace, call that subspace WI. WI. So I start with zero. I look at all elements in the kernel. Actually, not, not only V, I look at all elements in the kernel. I take those elements, apply B to it, get a bunch of, and that is a subspace. Take that subspace. Now pull it back under the matrix A. Uh, so it is like actually taking the pseudo inverse of the matrix A, pull it back, get a therefore a, a subspace here now, and then push back this subspace here. Keep repeating this process. Okay, so two things to notice. First is that WI plus one. So every time I come back here, the subspace that I end up with will be a superset of the subspace that I start off with. So every time I come here, I'm going to get a subspace and there is going to be a containment of this kind. So this is quite straightforward to see. So clearly WI plus one could increase in dimension, but I'm looking at N cross N matrices. So, uh, so therefore, if I look at, uh, at some point, this has to stabilize, yeah? Because we are saying the dimension of this subspace is actually could, cannot um, increase forever because we are working in a finite dimensional space. And one can easily check that when this stabilizes, this must be the case. And of course, it is the case that it stabilizes. Yeah, it will stabilize at some point. And the stabilizing subspace is what I will call W star. Okay, so once again, so is this definition clear of how you construct the sort of stabilizing space? Yeah, are there any questions on this? No, okay. So then we have the following lemma that A in B, let W star be the limiting of the second Wong sequence. So this is so you started with A and this family P, then there exists co rank A singularity witness of the family B, if and only if this limiting subspace is in the image of A. In this case, A is of maximal rank in B. And if I look at A inverse of W star, yeah, as this says, if A inverse of W star, I, I don't get anything larger by applying B to it. A inverse of W star is a co-rank B singularity witness. So I will, when I get when I apply to W star, I apply B, I end up in W star itself. So uh, <clears throat> the one way proof is easy. The other way is also not difficult, but I'm not going to show that. So what happens if W, so we want to show that if you, if it is the case that W star sits inside image of A, we want to show that in you have actually found something uh, which is uh, a co-rank, um, uh, uh, co rank of B singularity witness. Now that's what you want to show. Let us just show this. So A is of maximum rank. Therefore, the co rank of B is in fact the co rank of A because A has the largest rank. So if W star is in, in, in the image, then clearly if I look at the uh, A inverse of W star, its dimension is because I can, I can take a basis of W star and to this basis, I can add say all elements in the kernel of A. And of course, A of that is W star because the kernel elements that I've added anyway get killed. Yeah. 
So clearly the dimension of A inverse of W star is the dimension of W star plus the dimension of the kernel by very construction. Yeah. But we know that W star is, when I start with A inverse of W star, I don't get anything larger than W star. So when I apply the operators of B to it, I end, I end up in W star. Yeah. But now clearly then this has dimension, uh, this has dimension this much, dimension of W star plus dimension of kernel of A. And every element in B sends it back to W star. So clearly what you have done is to found, uh, you, what you've done is you have found something uh, this minus this is the shrinkage of this space. Yeah, A inverse W star gets shrunk by this quantity. Yeah. Yeah. So therefore, A inverse of W star is a uh, singularity weakness of this size. Yeah. Okay. So this actually suggests an alternate augmenting part algorithm. And uh, what is that algorithm? That algorithm says, well, you do this process. If W star happens to be inside the image, then you actually found uh, shrunk subspace. Yeah. Otherwise, what are you going to do? Otherwise, what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to find some vector in the kernel so that when I apply some element of B to it, that is in the image of A, therefore there, this, there, there is this element. But when I apply another element, of B, I can. So there is a way of going from this Z from. So this is the element in the kernel by repeatedly going, applying BI, BI, then there is an I1 such that BI1 of this, A inverse applied to that, BI2 of this, A inverse applied. See, finally, I come out here and this element here is not in the image. Yeah. So if this does not happen, then when it stabilizes, w, there must be some element here which is not in the image, but that element could only have come this way. Yeah. So what are we saying? There is an element in the kernel so that when I apply this sequence of operators to it in this order, I end up outside the image of A. Okay. So let us understand what this means actually, and then we will hopefully see the algorithm itself. So I can, I claim that I can assume that A is of this form. It has identity and it is in fact, there is a block of zeros. Why is that? Well, I can, I'm looking at A inverse, right? I can take all the matrices that I have and because I'm, I'm allowed to multiply on the left and also on the right, I claim I, uh, if, if you give me the A, I can multiply it on the left by something and multiply it. I can do uh, sort of Gaussian elimination so that there is an identity here. It's an N cross N matrix. So uh, I will see an identity and therefore I will see zero. But the way this is structured, if I do this for all matrices, then really um, uh, if uh, this product really uh, uh, when I multiply it out, uh, uh, if I multiply bi plus one on the left by something, then when I when I take a inverse, that matrix here pops up here in the inverse that cancels off. So I get the same product actually. So there is that that is one thing good. So therefore, I can eventually say that this must be the case. This must be really what is happening because I can really ignore this a inverse then because I know it's only identity after all. Yeah. So what are we saying? If I assume that A is in this nice form, in fact, a better, let me assume that it is in this form, that it is n minus one rank and there is a zero sitting here. So if it is the case that this does not, if W star is not in the image, then clearly, finally, what I have is I pulled out the ve this vector was getting killed by a sequence of BIs. I have pulled this vector out of the image of A. Yeah, is this clear? By applying these operators, here is a vector in the kernel. I apply these operators and I push it out of the image of A. Okay, and this is something that we are going to use. So suppose it happens in the very first attempt that this BI1 itself does the job for you. Then what does this mean? That if I look at 
this matrix A that I started off with, I, oh, I called it A1 here, but I should probably call it A. Let me do this. So this, so this is A. And if I look at determinant of X A plus BI1, so A was of this form. I know that BI1 of this vector is non-zero. Yeah, it is not in the image. Therefore, yeah, but this was, we assumed that A had this nice form. So the image is spanned by the first n minus one basis vectors, but if uh, uh, this is not in the image, uh, then uh, for that vector, I must really see a, a non-zero entry at the nth, at the nth place. Yeah. yeah. So if I look at this, so this bi one must be of the form where it has something non-trivial sitting in the uh, row n and uh, row n and column n because it is pulling out this vector v out of the image but the image we know of this a is spanned by the first n minus one basis vectors so it must be the case that if i look at bi1 bi1 must be a matrix which has some non trivial non non which has something non zero at its at its nth entry but then if i look at determinant of xa plus bi1 it looks like this. And if I calculate the determinant, I get B times Xn minus one plus some smaller terms in X of degree smaller in N. So therefore, if you want to find a mate, so therefore there, then I can, what I can do is to try all possible choices for, uh, if I have a field of reasonable size, I can check whether some X works, which will take me to a non-zero determinant. Yeah, and then I have increased the rank from n minus one to something of rank n, and I'm done. So you can really try all possibilities. Try n, in fact, n values. And see if some x works, and you can increase the rank. So what have we done? We've just assumed that if this is the case and I've assumed that A is in this nice form, then really this is what we are looking for. Pulling out a vector in the kernel out of the image of A. Yeah. So let's take another uh, situation where all the BIs are the same. They are the same as one fixed B. Then again, we are saying B times B times B when I apply L times, this vector V gets pulled out of the image. But then B to the L must be a vector of, must be a matrix. If I write down the matrix of B to the L, because it has pulled out that uh, vector in the kernel, it must again have a non-zero entry in its nth entry. So now I can choose a nice basis. Let us write down the matrices A and B in some nice basis. What is the basis I'm going to choose? My last basis element is going to be B. The other basis elements, I'm going to apply B to V. I'm, apply, I'm going to apply B times B to V. I'm applying B times B times B. So BL times V. BL times V is, of course, out of the image. And if I look at in this, so I can take, take this basis and I can now complete it to a basis of my vector space. So I have V, I have BV, I have B squared V, I have B to the LV. Now complete it to a basis of the uh, underlying vector space. Then one can easily check that this matrix XA plus B has this form. And this is not difficult. So I, for example, if you look at this last uh, vector, this is the image of V. But of course, what is the image of V? A kills V. But what does B do to V? B pushes it to the uh, to BV. But that is really the uh, first element according to my according to me. If I look at so what I'm saying is if I look at 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, which is this, then what I get is really 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which is really this first basis element. So that's why this matrix, at least its last column is really this. One can check that the other columns are also, the, are also correct. So if I look at this matrix now and I calculate the determinant of this matrix, yeah, one can actually show that the determinant has this form. The determinant looks like some x to the n minus l plus lower degree terms. Yeah. Where this l appears here, yeah. 
what can i do i can uh, so there there could be some elements in the diagonal so i will write each of these diagonals as x plus something and then i do this any anyway, i'm not going to go into great details of this but this is the rough idea and once again what we will try and do is to find various values of x which will work to increase the rank okay and the general idea would also be this that if my matrix can be written the starting matrix can be written like this and the uh, the element uh, uh, if bi1 bi2 bil when applied to v pull it out let me take a generic matrix of this form a generic matrix b of this form x1 times bi1 plus x2 times bi2 plus xl times bil then once again if i compute the lth power of this yeah the lth power of this is this matrix raised to l and of course in its when i expand it i certainly have the term bi1 bi2 bil multiplied by x1 x2 xl so clearly i will have in the nth entry i will see a term because i know that bl has something non bi1 bi2 bil in the nth entry i have something non zero which i call b and then i have x1 x2 xl and one can check that the other terms are also homogeneous excepting that when i do this there is a problem the problem could be that the other terms can interfere there could be some kind of interference and i may get nothing out of it and this is indeed the case so i will show this by a simple example as i said a good example to keep in mind is this uh, skew three cross three uh, matrices or skew symmetric matrix the uh, take this so suppose i take a1 to be this skew symmetric matrix a2 to be this and a3 to be this so like i said the first thing to do is so look at this element this element now uh, ha, ha, has something in its kernel so i sort of arrange it so that this in a in a certain basis looks like this and that can be got by multi pre multiplying it by this matrix you can check this out so i multiply all the matrices by pre multiply all the matrices by this so this matrix becomes this this becomes this and this becomes this so i can start with a1 like we did and then see what happens when i look at the family spanned by these three matrices uh one can check that a2 square now this is the a2 a2 squared is this the square of this matrix is this the square of this matrix can't be uh is this correct uh, have i made a mistake oh, this is correct okay a3 squared is this yeah a2 squared is this and a3 squared is this suppose i were to do this then clearly if i look at a2 times a3 i actually get something here but unfortunately even a3 times a2 gives me something here so when i look at x a2 plus y a3 which is what we wanted to do we wanted to take this matrix of this form and raise it to its second power unfortunately what happens is that these sort of interfere with each other and i end up with something with zero here yeah okay so this idea of using of re of really reducing to the case where i have just two single matrices where one of the matrix is really obtained by looking at the bunch of matrices which pulled out the element of the kernel and writing it this way and then trying to see if i can massage it somehow to increase the rank yeah that does not work in this case yeah and it will not because i know that in the skew symmetric matrices the largest rank that i can see is only 2 i cannot get rank 3 there but i know skew symmetric matrices don't shrink so what really is going on and what is really going on is that i have unfortunately assumed that my x and y are commuting variables i should not be assuming that so what may happen we may not be able to increase the rank sitting inside the base field f but i might be able to increase it if i were to go to a larger field you may not and uh, be able to increase rank in mnf but maybe in an extension so let us see this in this particular example so what i will do is i will look at the ring of quaternions so i have taken this ring 
I've got three. So this ring is this. The ring of quaternions is this. And suppose I do the same whatever I was doing with the skew symmetric matrices with a two and a three. Suppose I look at x a two plus y a three, where now x and y don't commute. X and y is z, but y and x when I multiply I get minus z. Yeah. So when I do this, these things don't cancel off. I don't get z minus z, but I get z minus or minus z, and that becomes two z here actually. And then one can easily check that if I look at this matrix A one plus X A two plus Y A three, I get a matrix of this form, and this is full rank. Yeah. So if I were somehow able to work with variables which don't commute, I am able to sort of increase the rank in that larger ring, or in, in fact, in the ring of quaternions. Yeah. So more, one more way of saying the whole thing is the following, actually. So there is a natural representation of the ring of quaternions in two cross two matrices. And what is that representation? Under that representation, x, little x goes to this matrix, i minus i, little y goes to this matrix, one minus one, and z goes to this. One can check that all these relations are actually, actually hold here. So this gives me a good representation. And when I look at this now, I get this matrix. And now, when I interpret these as, uh, uh, so I can lift this to a representation of M N three, and I what I can get is really a six cross six matrix. So this representation can be lifted to a representation of the ring of uh, uh, the ring of Q symmetry to M N three in in our M three F in our case. I can lift this representation to M three F. And under this, this matrix has this representation where these are all now. Uh, <clears throat> there are uh, this has this is a two cross two matrix. This is a two cross two matrix. So this full matrix is a six cross six matrix, and this six cross six matrix has a non-zero determinant. Yeah. So this has been obtained by taking a representation of the quaternions. So this is the punchline that one has to remember. That the rank may not increase in your uh, in in the linear space that you are looking at, but the rank has actually increased in the second blow up of this space. The, so these are three cross three matrices. If I take the second blow up, I get six cross six matrices, and this example seems to tell us that the second blow up actually gives you a uh, matrix which is non singular, and that. Is all, all, all they, they one should expect this also because the rank of B could be strictly smaller than the N C rank of B. So you can't maybe you might you might saturate your rank, but if your N C rank is larger, there is no way you can increase the rank sitting where you are. You should take blow ups and try to get matrices in the larger blow up space. That is a possibility, and this is in fact. Exactly what we exploit, that this is a general phenomenon. Yeah. So if if W star is not in the image of A, and there is a bunch of matrices which pull out an element of the kernel, yeah, I can do the following then. If there are L matrices, I choose some D bigger than L, and I I look not at A at the underlying space, but I tensor it now with D cross D matrices. I look at this matrix and I look at this matrix. This matrix has been has been arranged very carefully. So here was my B one, B two, B L. I'm not going to do X one, B I one plus X two, B I two plus X I L, B I L. Instead, I'm going to multiply. I'm going to take these X I's as uh, non-commuting variables, and the variables that I'm going to take for them are these elementary symmetric matrices, matrices which a matrix which has a one in the second row and first column, a matrix which has One in the third row and second column, and then plus one. So I'm going to, if I look at this matrix and I look at this matrix, yeah, then one can actually show that if, of course, we we knew that V was in the kernel of A. So if I start with this element, V tensor U one, of course, that is going to be in the kernel of this matrix. But now, if I apply B to the L to V one tensor U one, yeah. B to the L. So I'm taking this matrix and raising it to the lth power. 
but there is a nice product i can read by looking at it this way bl so and that is really this a i l tensor e l plus 1 l then a i l minus 1 tensor e oh not a it should be b i'm sorry b i l tensor this not this not l l minus 1 dot b i 1 tensor e this was 2 1 i thought this oh, oh sorry what am i doing yeah b i 1 tensor e 2 1 so inside the lth power i have a term coming from multiplying this with this with this with this in this order but then i get bil but i am applying it to v1 so it is bil bl bil minus 1 times bi1 but that has taken it bi bil bi1 takes v out of its uh, out of the kernel of a so i get uh, a, a b i l b i1 applied to v tensor e l l plus 1 e l l minus 1 this will give me e l plus 1 one applied to u1 but that is the l plus first vector so now this is therefore non zero this is also non zero so there is an element in v tensor u there is an element in the kernel of this larger matrix which has been completely pulled out by this product yeah so now if i look at this matrix so this w so if i start with this second wong sequence which is a prime this matrix and this matrix then in its uh, the second wong sequence correspond to this the the limiting subspace that i end up with is not in the image but if it is not in the image then i can take a lambda times a prime plus b and try and increase the rank just like we did when in the when i had a two matrix case and i can actually increase the rank yeah, and this matrix its rank can increase yeah and uh, so recall a suppose a i started off with a which had rank r yeah so then when i take the tensor product of the d cross d matrix i'm going to get a matrix which has rank this matrix a prime certainly has rank r times d yeah now when i take some linear combination with this matrix b that i have set up this has rank strictly larger than r times d so its rank is of the form r d plus 1 bigger than or equal to r d plus 1 yeah now come kicks in a very important observation the regularity lemma of blobs i am not going to prove this i have the proof written here that if a is a linear subspace of matrices and i look at its dth blob yeah a is a linear subspace of matrices and i take its dth blob the rank of the dth blob is always going to be a multiple of d okay so what does that that mean in this case so we have something which has a rank rd plus 1 it it is strictly more than bigger than or equal to rd plus 1 so therefore there must be something of rank rd plus d inside this inside this dth blob because the the rank of that matrix space is a multiple of d so there must be something of this rank certainly inside it so therefore i have increased the rank from i had this base matrix a of rank r i have gone to a larger matrix which has rank d times r plus 1 and that is what the regularity lemma allows us to actually show so this regularity lemma uh, i may not prove but so where well, it plays a fairly important role actually that if i take a matrix space and i take its second blob i know the largest rank is going to be a multiple of 2 and this again okay i should say it's, there is a caveat here that, that the underlying field should be reasonably large this is not true if the field size is very very small okay so we are assuming our field sizes are reasonable okay if that is the case uh, okay i will skip this proof if somebody wants it we can do it so therefore 
what we can do is that i round up the rank from rd plus something something bigger than rd plus something bigger than rd to its next multiple namely r plus 1 and in our paper we actually show how to do the all of this algorithmically one can actually set up just like we worked with quaternions one can work with certain kinds of division algebras and say well in working with in those division algebras one can actually get a matrix of larger rank and this is the theorem that if you have a matrix space and if i take its dth blow up and suppose i start with a matrix of rank r times d in that yeah and uh, let d prime be strictly bigger than r and for a large enough f there is a deterministic algorithm so i'm going to, if i start with this matrix which has rank r and d then i'm going to apply my second wong sequence idea to that so either i'm going to find something w star which is in the image of a in which case i know that the co rank of this is nd minus rd yeah so that's what this is it either returns uh, nd minus rd shrunk subspace or i will I, i know that there is a sequence of elements which takes me out of the kernel i will use that the number of elements that i will see which pull me out i will then tensor my space of matrices that i am currently in with that if that number of matrices which pull pulled an element out of the kernel of a was say 5 i i will i'll not tensor this space by 6 i will go to b times 6d space in that space i know that i'm going to get a matrix of rank r plus 1 times d positively yeah so i can then repeat this process yeah and every so if i start off with something of rank finally in my base space either there is a singular matrix or there is either there is a non singular matrix which is, which which has rank n and finally in my final block by doing this process i will get something which has multiple n times whatever the blow up that i finally did in which case i know that my b1 b2 bm that i start off with does not shrink a subspace yeah okay so this is this of course gives you an exp- this is the exponential time algorithm so there is a lot of things that one there is a lot of bookkeeping that one needs to do but this is the rough idea that you blow up use the second wong sequence to try and increase rank but you cannot do it in the base space that you are currently in you need to do a further blow up in that further blow up you will get you will be able to find the matrix whose rank has increased nicely from r times d to at least r plus 1 times d times d prime whatever so this is this is something that can be done and this can now give you an algorithm which uh, one can actually check eventually when you stop you will stop by saying okay there is a shrunk subspace and then you can come back and find the shrunk subspace down actually down in the base space in the base space that you are working in the n cross n matrices that you are working with so all that is there in the paper yeah or you can eventually report that this is not in the null code and this can be done okay so i will just indicate so right the way we were doing it so i could start with some d then maybe i will have to go to a larger d prime and so on so the final blow up that this theorem gives us is really an exponential blow up because it could blow up by a factor of n factorial because the largest i can get by this is n times uh, one can actually one can actually show that at n plus 1 factorial you will stop you don't need to do larger blow ups than that but but potentially this method only gives you an n plus 1 factorial kind of a uh, blow up and that is just too large it gives you an exponential time algorithm of course yeah so uh, so this is uh, uh, what uh, uh, we did in that first paper yeah but uh, what uh, dirksen and markham markham observed was that you really never have to blow up beyond n plus 1 so i'll indicate that proof that proof is quite straightforward actually uh, suppose i give you suppose i give you a blow up which is strictly larger than n plus 1 and suppose you tell me here is this matrix yeah which is non singular yeah and it is in say the 
dth blow up of the matrix. So we've all always started with n cross n matrices. And suppose I have blown it up beyond n plus one. Then write down this as a bunch of, think of this as a d by d blocks. There are d cross d blocks, each block containing an n by n matrix. So finally, this is an ND by ND matrix, but there are this, think of each of these slots. So there are D squared slots, each slot holding an N by N matrix for us. So if you give me a matrix, which is non-singular, yeah, that non-singular matrix, let me write it down like this, okay? If I write it down like this, what I will do is I will just stare at this part of the matrix, which is given in blue. Yeah, I will stare at this part of the matrix. Yeah, I will ask what is the rank of this blue part? Okay, now this blue part I have obtained by taking out n columns and n rows, correct? From this big matrix. Yeah, so clearly this is true that the rank of uh, this is certainly bigger than dn minus 2n. Because this matrix, the d, dn by dn matrix, we assumed was full rank. Therefore, its rank was dn. Yeah, I have removed at most n rows and n columns. So the rank of what I am going to be left with cannot shrink by more than 2n. So the rank of the blue thing is at least dn minus 2n. But dn minus 2n, you can write it like this, dn minus n plus 1 minus n plus 1. Let's rewrite this. Now use the fact that we say, we had said d was strictly bigger than n plus 1. This is what we assumed. If d is strictly bigger than n plus 1, then this rank of the blue matrix that I am left with certainly dominates this number because it is equal to this, it, uh, it is bigger than or rank of this is bigger than or equal to dn minus 2n, which is equal to this, but that is strictly bigger than dn minus n plus 1 minus d. I will just write it. It is strictly bigger than d minus 1 times n minus 1. But this is a matrix in the d minus 1th blow up of the matrix algebra that I started with. Once again, record, take recourse to a regularity lemma. Its rank is strictly bigger than d minus 1 cross n minus 1. It is therefore at least d minus 1 times n minus 1 plus something. But then I know its rank must be a multiple of d minus 1. So therefore, this itself has full rank. Its rank is full. Yeah. So therefore, I would you, you, every time I get a matrix which has rank larger than n times d for some d which is bigger than n plus 1, I can shrink it down, get a matrix, a smaller matrix, which has the same rank. Yeah. So this way we don't have to blow up too much. And then when you put all of it together, you get a polyt polytamic algorithm to protect null cone membership. Yeah. Yeah. So this is where I'll stop.